Okay, thank you everyone and thank you for coming and uh, you know we can start the presentation and it's very interactive so everybody you know please you know interrupt me anytime you want. Okay? Okay. All right. So here are the leaders and we have uh, almost everybody here. Jessica is coming a little bit later with his friend uh, her friend and Alex is still in London, I believe. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, oh, great. Oh, yes, of course. Great wanted to be here, but he's so busy working on the human trial, the second human trial for his uh, amazing invention. Yes. Yo, remember this yo thing? So <laughs> it's crazy how huh? they raised uh, $1.5 million uh, for just a simple app. And the thing is that the world doesn't need you know, another messaging app unless it's really, truly you know, can change the world for the better. So what do we need? Well, we all know the answer. Superman and Supergirl. Well, not quite. Okay. Well, Christopher Reeve, you know, he uh, played Superman for many years. And of course, we all know that he suffered a spinal cord injury in a horse riding accident in 1995. And this is what he said in 2002. So two years before his death. Uh, basically, he said that he was very really angry and disappointed, you know, the scientific research it's not where it should be, okay? And uh, basically, we didn't get the you know, full government support, okay? Because government funding goes a long way, you know, especially in research. We're gonna talk more about it. So, and then uh, Google co-founder Larry Page uh, when asked the question, are people really focusing on the right things? Okay, that's a very good question. Are people really focus on the right things? And of course, Larry Page, uh, Moonshot, is to conquer death, right? It's one of the things that Google wanted to do, or still want to do. So that brings us to the core idea number one of the Transhumanist Party, and it is we support significant life extension and quality of life improvement achieved through the progress of science and technology. Okay, that's the core idea number one. And I call it the Moonshot as well. So if you think about the uh, moon landing, it turns out that there was uh, only a 50-50% chance. And this is by National Armstrong. And he said that uh, we thought we had 90% chance of getting back safely to Earth, but only 50-50 chance of making a landing on the moon. Okay, there's so many variables, so many unknowns, and you know, it's, it's a really risky thing. Okay, they may have to abort and come back to Earth before landing, but they did anyway, okay? So a lot of effort by the government and by the public, American public, to say, okay, let's you know, let's do moon landing, even though you know the chance was only 50-50. But of course, successful. Okay, Apollo 11 landed on the moon successfully in 1969. Now, if you look at government spending, we have the information about 2016 tax dollar and where the money went. So you can see the healthcare is 29 cents on the dollar. And the Pentagon and military is 23 cents on the dollar. And if you go all the way to the right, you'll see that science is only 1%, okay? Education is only like 2.8 cents, okay? So you can see what the priority is. Now, healthcare does, you know, occupy a whole chunk, uh, a pretty big percentage. But again, you know, what, how do you spend money on healthcare? Okay, so we have to look into that as well, okay? And this is what's interesting too. So that's the government spending. As you can see, the spending on science and education and so on is very small. So private companies are filling the gap, obviously, right? Like uh, SpaceX, you know, they're going to the Mars and beyond. Earlier we were talking about that. So there are these private companies. Now, the pharmaceutical industry, also private companies, right? Uh, maybe public companies, you know, if they have uh, an IPO or whatever. But the thing is that in 2015, there was a 5,000% increase in drug price for the particular drug, okay? And what he is the, is what's happening. So in 2009, it's only a dollar per pill. And then 2014, it's $13.50. In 2015, the company was sold to another person and he you know, increased by 5,000% to $750 a pill. And of course, the public was outraged, right? Post-tax and so on. But then a, a year later, they cut the price in half. Still. Look at that, $375 a pill versus $1. Okay, what's happening here? Mm -hmm. Right, so going back to idea number one, the moonshot. 
So we do want to have you know technology to extend our life and also increase our quality of life. But we we know that can be achieved in our, our lifetime. But the question is, can anybody afford it? Who can afford it? That's always a big question, isn't it? So that brings us to ideal number two, which is that we support an inclusive cultural, societal, and political atmosphere, informed and animated by reason and science, to foster peace, prosperity, and universal rights for all. So essentially, what I'm trying to say is that it's very inclusive. We don't want to leave anybody out. Okay. And to do that, well, there are a lot of ways to do that. Of course, it's just one of the reasons why we have meetings, why we, you know, communicate and discuss and think about ideas. So one of the things we do is uh, education. We need to educate people, really. And I'm editing a book called Transhumanism in the Image of Humans. It's going to be published by Springer Science and Business Media, which will be released in the middle of this year. Okay. And then, of course, there are so many actions we can do. You know, for example, what if we identify technologies, and what if we allow nonprofits to invest and take majority shares of these transhumanist technologies to improve healthcare. And the goal is to have an affordable technological solution for anything that we want to do as a transhumanist. Okay. Now here's an example. It was just yesterday. The news was that the Bill Gates Foundation paid off Nigeria's seventy-six million dollar debt in order to the polio, turn into polio-free country, basically eradicate the disease. But who's going to pay for all the drugs? Who's going to pay for all the medical services, Bill Gates. Okay, so basically they pay off 100% of Nigeria's debt in healthcare because of the fight against polio. Okay, that's one good example. And of course, we have the Transhumanist Constitution. If you look at the website, there's a lot happening. People get to vote. Okay, on you know what should be in the constitution. So there's a lot of discussions going on, a lot of votes, voting going on. And of course, we have the the national U.S. Transhumanist Party and the local party, California. That's where you are. Yeah. We are. Yeah. We have other local states, Nevada. Who else? Where else? We have a transhumanist party in Texas. We have one in Kentucky. We have a transhumanist party, at least that used to be active in D.C. And then New Hampshire transhumanist party. We may have two organizations. Vying to be the New Hampshire Transhumanist Party, so we'll see which one of them manages to become the best organized and reach legitimacy most rapidly. We are always open to other state parties being formed, and they can exist at various stages of formation. Some of the parties essentially just have Facebook pages at this stage. For instance, the Transhumanist Party of Colorado or the Transhumanist Party of Illinois. But if anybody wants to take these. Organizations get in contact with the existing members and leadership and take them to the next level. We would welcome that very much, and we would be happy to provide information and assistance in terms of spreading the word. You mentioned Newton. We have an active website where content gets published. On an almost daily basis, we have a discussion thread on the website for these kinds of endeavors, and also people may use our Facebook page, which is U.S. Transhumanist Party, or our Facebook group, which is called just Transhumanist Party, in order to network and essentially build upon these collaborations and start state and local transhumanist organizations.、Mm-hmm. Thank you, Janani. So,、uh, of course, we want to put people in you know, local and national offices, public offices, and、uh, think about who is the candidate for 2020. Okay, that's U.S. presidential candidate for 2020. Okay, so core ideal number three: we want to support efforts to use science, technology, and rational discourse to reduce and eliminate existential risk to the human species. That's kind of interesting. Now. We earlier we had a discussion about you know where do will people live right we can obviously live on land on earth but we can also live under ocean because most of the earth is under ocean anyway right or you know we can live in outer orbits but well I'm not sure about that and then of course some people want to go to Mars another planet and、uh, in the cloud and smartphones some is more like the uploading the mind you know? now then you don't have any physical manifestation so virtual. So, but what's interesting is that what is the future society make up? Okay, it doesn't matter where you are in Mars or on Earth. Of course, we have the regular human beings in the Amish. Okay, and we have genetically enhanced humans and designer babies. We have cyborgs, half human, half machine. 
We have Androids, 100% machines. They may have human appearance. And of course, they have artificial general intelligence, human emotions, and so on. And of course, there's also upload of minds living in the cloud, you know, totally virtual, 100% digital. So that's a very interesting future society makeup, I think. So to me, it's really important. It's very important to have infinite diversity, infinite combinations, which says that beauty, growth, and progress all results from the union of the unlike. Who is a Star Trek fan? One, two, three. Okay, Star Trek fan. Everybody is Star Trek fans. Okay, good. MIT professor Marvin Minsky said, uh, he wrote in Society of Minds that what magical trick makes such intelligence? The trick is that there's no trick. The power of intelligence stems from a vast diversity not from any single perfect principle. So he's a very smart professor. I think it's a really good quote from him. Lee, okay. yes. the Future of Life Institute, founded by like Nick Bostrom and other AI experts, they have people like Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk on their panel. They're doing a great job at doing research to solve the ethical issues of like AI and various transhumanist issues. And they're putting a lot of money into it. And, like Elon Musk, I think, put like $10 million. And open AI is, like, is really focused on the ethics of uh, AI research. So I think it'd be important to emulate a lot what they're doing with their research. That's what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, that's one of them. So, so back to the core ideal. Now we really need to protect all segments of society yeah, because it's a very diverse big up. But it's also it's, it's to do with existential risk too. Because what if there's a computer virus that wipes out all the cyborgs and humans that are connected to the internet? Well, at least we still have the damage. We are not connected to anything. So just saying, you know. <laughs> so we need to protect them too. So we need to bring the Amish into the transhumanist society. So Oh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> yes, I think we need to communicate to the Amish and other individuals who may be conservative about certain uses of technology that we do support their right to make those kinds of decisions and to choose those ways to live as long as we all agree to coexist peacefully. And for those of us who wish to pursue technological enhancement, they should respect our rights to do so, just as we should respect their rights not to do so. I agree. So, you know, if you can raise me and a half, we can do much better, okay? We are the pioneers, we are the transhumanists, and we have a lot of work ahead of us. Okay, so back to the agenda. I actually emailed you all the agendas. And so the overview of the book that I'm editing, we actually have looked at a lot of it already in the PowerPoint. But here is a partial list of chapters. Uh, you can see a lot of interesting topics from philosophy to science to biology to medicine to space geoengineering, time change, artificial intelligence, of course, anti-aging, economics, religion. Okay, let's not forget religion. We are part of humanity, art, and more. So, and point number three, which is political candidates, okay, and political campaigns in 2018, which is the Congress, right? The Senate and the Congress, House of Representatives, is 2018, and then, of course, the U.S. presidential election in 2020. So, if you know of anybody who may be, you know, interested in running for office, please bring it up. Let us know, okay? Seriously, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So with regard to the 2020 presidential candidate, we have been recently discussing the subject in our internal U.S. Transhumanist Party Google group. And what we have right now is a set of aspirations for whom we would want that person to be, the qualities we would want that person to have. We would want that person to be scientifically literate, not necessarily a scientist, but somebody who is conversant with the scientific method and understands its importance. We would want this individual to be articulate to be able to communicate transhumanist ideas in a manner that is both accurate and that members of the public could identify with. And there are many possible backgrounds from which that individual could come. That person could be an academician, a research scientist, an entrepreneur, an author, a policy thinker who may have worked in think tanks before, a public intellectual who holds discussion panels or speaking tours on issues of importance and issues of depth. So we are casting a wide net in terms of our search for a candidate. One of my hopes is that when Newton's compilation, Transhumanism in the Image of Humans, is released, a lot of erudite individuals will read it, and some of them will be interested in 
nominating themselves to be our candidate. And of course, anybody is going to be free to nominate themselves. I envision opening up a formal nomination process sometime later in 2018. And then we're going to have an electronic primary process where our members at that time are going to be able to cast their votes for all of the nominees using a ranked preference ballot, which means they're not just going to vote for one person. And we're not going to have a situation like the major political parties have where some potentially promising candidates might get eliminated early on. Everybody is going to have the chance to rank order the entire slate of nominees. So the primary is going to happen all at once. And with the ranked preference method, if no candidate gets a majority of first preferences right away on the first round, we do what is called an instant runoff process, where the person getting the lowest number of number one votes gets eliminated, and everybody who voted for that person then gets their number two vote reassigned to be the number one vote on the next round. Their number three vote gets reassigned to be the number two vote on the next round. And that process happens iteratively until we have one person who gets a majority of the reassigned votes. And that way, it is very nuanced and it is fair because people aren't really voting against somebody. People aren't really voting for a suboptimal choice in their view because they are afraid that a really negative choice in their view is going to win otherwise. So this is how we've been doing our platform votes over the past year. And as a result, we have arrived at a platform that seems to have a strong consensus of our members behind it. And we hope to achieve the same with regard to whichever individual is ultimately our nominee. So that's going to be a process that I'm going to invest a lot of my time in later this year in terms of soliciting candidates and making sure each candidate for the nominee is able to present a case for why they should be selected. With regard to other offices, one of our biggest challenges right now is ballot access at the state level, because even in states that have lower thresholds, one still has to acquire several thousand petition signatures by hand. And as an example, in Nevada, it's about 5,400 signatures, and it's based on how many people voted in the last congressional election. So in terms of where we might have the most promising opportunities, we think the local level may actually work better for getting candidates elected. And there are two ways in which we could potentially go about doing that. If local ballot access requirements are less stringent than state ballot access requirements, and there are enough transhumanists in a given community that they could go around and canvas and get a few petition signatures, we might get the transhumanist party on some local ballots. Or we could have candidates running as independents for any office, and then the candidates could submit to us their platforms, what kinds of changes they hope to achieve when in office, and the membership of the transhumanist party will review those candidates, and we can decide whether we as an organization would endorse them. So that way they wouldn't officially be transhumanist party candidates, but they would be independent candidates endorsed by the transhumanist party. And the state level transhumanist party can do the same thing. This is how Zoltan Istvan actually ran for president in 2016. He made a filing of his candidacy with the Federal Election Commission, but the transhumanist party as an organization, because it didn't get the many thousands of petitions needed to achieve ballot access in the various states, couldn't register as a political party with the FEC, though Zoltan tried to register it. So instead, the transhumanist party was used essentially as a brand for his campaign without being a formally registered political party, but he was a validly registered independent candidate who followed all of the rules that pertain to independent candidates. So that's another option we could pursue. Now, I myself am going to be running for a completely nonpartisan office in 2018, which will be the board of trustees of the 
Indian Hills General Improvement District. It's a small quasi-governmental entity on the boundary between Carson City, Nevada and Douglas County, Nevada. It's actually technically encompassed in both, and it essentially oversees infrastructure, the water system, the sewer system, a bit of road maintenance, a bit of public health and safety types of measures. It is not a homeowners association. It is relatively laissez-faire in how it oversees the neighborhood. And I, as someone who respects individual freedom and property rights, would want to help keep it that way while making sure the infrastructure is well maintained. So this wouldn't be strictly a transhumanist party associated endeavor because it's an independent candidacy, a nonpartisan position. I don't expect even to have opponents because there are enough open slots for it. But it would be a transhumanist getting elected to that kind of position and using a rational scientific way of thinking, definitely very technology friendly in order to help keep the neighborhood a good place to live. And likewise, we encourage people to consider running for their local level offices whether that be a board of trustees position or a city council or a school board, and consider ways in which transhumanist principles might apply to how those offices would operate. It's as simple as if you're running for your local school board and you support science education or you support having the kids be able to access a tech lab and conduct experiments or build machines of their own, that's a way to invest in the future. A lot of transhumanist aspirations can be rendered very much compatible with what people in the mainstream consider to be desirable goals and framed and packaged in such a way that you could get the majority of the electorate in your area to accept your candidacy and what you're trying to do. Well, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. In fact, that was a discussion that Newton and I had with Alex Lightman on a conference call a couple weeks back. Alex, you know Alex Lightman, I assume, uh, you know, and he's the campaign director here for the California Transhumanist Party. He is considering the uh, possibility of running for, was the council for uh, Santa Monica. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so that's, Right up exactly what you said. Maybe you're aware of it already. Maybe you talked to him, but he seems pretty enthusiastic about it. And I think that would be a, an excellent start because he pointed out what you brought up too was the fact that you know there's a lot of not only the signings but the financial obstacles that would be required for a, a much heavier lift if you're trying to talk about a national endeavor or even a statewide endeavor. So I like what you just said, and I, I think that's exactly what we were talking about. So I just wanted to point out, yeah, Alex Lightman is somebody that seemed to be serious about it. So we'll, we'll see. That's what he said, yeah. 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 So, yeah, he wanted to do it as a transhumanist, mm -hmm. through the transhumanist party. I just wanted to point that out. Absolutely. And I did speak with Alex at the Super Longevity holiday party on December 2nd. I'm glad that he's considering this and we will do what we can to assist him in terms of publicity, getting out word of any announcements he would hope to make, as well as looking into the steps that would be needed and how, from a formal standpoint, we would frame his candidacy. So whether he could get ballot access for the Transhumanist Party in Santa Monica, or whether we're going to need to go the route of him officially being an independent candidate, but then we could endorse him and we could say in our messaging something to the effect of transhumanist Alex Lightman endorsed by the U.S. Transhumanist Party and the California Transhumanist Party is running for the city council of Santa Monica. So those kinds of options are ones we would like to explore with him. And I have been in contact with him periodically. I also follow him on Facebook. So as this develops, I'll be happy to have that conversation with him. And certainly, Newton, you've been in contact with him as well. So we can perhaps have that conversation jointly. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to encourage him. So that sounds like a possible candidate. Mm -hmm.